This is the Bigger Pockets Podcast, show 223. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online. What's going on, everybody? This is Josh Dorkin, host to the Bigger Pockets podcast, here with my co-host, Mr. Brandon Turner. What's up, man? You know, things are going really, really well for me right now. You know, I got a little baby girl who's uh, I didn't how ask walk, how you're and, doing. Uh, you know, it's great. Oh, I'll, and you have to talk about your baby girl when I was going to give you a hard time. And, yep, exactly. Okay. Now she's you so to, cute. <laughs> she's so cute. How about you? How's your, uh, you and yours, your family and all that? Oh, they're so cute, man. They're cute. You know, it's really cool. This week, my eldest is eight in second grade. Uh, she built a wire sculpture. And uh, it was selected to go to this art exposition um, and uh, amongst, ex- you know, artworks from from lots of mostly older kids. She was one of just like a handful of kids picked uh, out of her entire school and it displayed with artwork from kids all around the city of Denver. It was it was really cool. It was That's a proud funny. papa moment. Yeah, I was going to say proud daddy. Look at that. Like, yeah, that yeah, was of, awesome. That's very cool. Yeah. Well, this week, uh, so you good. know. You know, my, my, my daughter got food all over her face because that's all I, I'm proud about right now. But, nice. you know, whatever. That's all awesome. Right. That's awesome. Man, well, today uh, today we got a show, dude. We this have a is, show. This is a long show. It is. But I want to encourage you guys. I mean, this is a longer show, but if you have to break this into two halves and you know listen on your commute to and from work, listen to the whole thing. When I mean, we start talking about things like, I mean, it, we start with real estate, we get into frugality, and then we talk about how to actually in- increase your income. If you have a job right now, how to like, you know, 2x, 3x, 5x it. I mean, I, there's some cool stuff in this. We talk about wealth building. We talk about increasing your income. We, we talk about looking in the mirror at who you are and what you do and and trying to figure out if that's the you that you want to be. Um, it, it's, it's fascinating. This is probably one of the deeper shows we've ever done in, just in terms of mindset, philosophy. Um, and we tackle a lot of amazing topics. I, I, I think it, this is very relevant for, for anyone and everyone. Uh, so definitely stay tuned. Uh, it's it's going to be a good one. Uh, that it is. But all right, before we get to the show, let's get to today's quick tip. tip. All right, today's quick tip is nice and simple. Uh, we actually are launching a new book here at Bigger Pockets. It is called Set for Life. And in fact, we're talking to the author today, Scott Trench. Uh, and so today's quick tip is very simple. Go to biggerpockets.com slash set for life. And uh, pick up a copy of this book. We talk about it later in the in the actual interview. Uh, but trust me, you guys are going to want to buy this in the first week. If you guys enjoy books, not just on real estate, but just uh, wealth building in general, uh, you're going to want to get this book. And there's some amazing bonuses if you buy during the first week. Uh, that's very important. We're actually uh, trying to hit a, a bestsellers list. And you guys can help us by doing that. So go to biggerpockets.com slash set for life. Uh, and that'll give you links to Amazon. You can go to Barnes & Noble, all that good stuff. So there's your quick tip, set for life. Cool. Awesome. Awesome. So, all right, guys. So today's show, we're going to just dive into this. We are talking to Scott Trench, the man, the myth, the legend. He is actually a legend in his own mind. It's, it's quite funny, but hey, no, can, Scott, I, I got to read this real quick. I know you usually, you usually introduce a guest, but I, I want to read this because this is a cool little phrase here. It was on the okay. back of the book. I actually just got a copy of the, yeah, I'm looking at the back of the book at the, the and it says Scott Trench is a perpetual student of personal finance, real estate investing, sales, business, and personal management. He's a real estate investor an executive at an online corporation. I don't know what corporation that is. Uh, salesman and an author. He's a proponent of different kinds of money management. One that involves frugality, calculated risk, and a lot of hard work. That's pretty uh, impressive. It's impressive. Uh, he's got an impressive little resume there. He's got an impressive resume. He's an impressive guy. He's somebody that you and I both look up to. Yep. Um, and um, I'm, I'm definitely honored not only to have him work here at Bigger Pockets. We're honored to have him on the show. And frankly, I'm ecstatic that he wrote this book. It's, it's incredible. But let's get into it. Let's talk about this stuff. So Scott Trench, welcome back to the show, man. It's good to have you here. Good to be back. <laughs> it's been a while. It has it been has. a little while. Yeah, you were back on what number ninety nine, I think. Like yep, three. Uh, it was three personal finance bloggers and their first investment property. Fancy, so. fancy. Well, people want to listen to that. They can go back to biggerpockets.com slash show ninety nine and listen to a little bit of your story there. But uh, today we're talking about something a little bit different. Uh, but yeah. for those who have not heard that episode, why don't we give a quick recap? Who are you, and uh, how'd you get involved in real estate? 
So uh, my name is Scott Trench. I'm the VP of Operations here at Bigger Pockets, and I wanted to get into real estate because when I graduated college, I was welcomed into the real world by a cubicle job crunching spreadsheets, <laughs> um, and that was not exactly how I wanted to spend the rest of my life. Um, and uh, now you have an office career. crunching spreadsheets, right? Now I have an office crunching spreadsheets, but it's it's a little better, you know. I get to work here at Bigger Pockets, <laughs> help, help millions of people uh, achieve financial freedom. So, nice. but yeah, so I wanted to uh, I wanted to move towards financial freedom, and so I started become saving my pennies, becoming very frugal, and listening to a show called the Bigger Pockets Podcast. Nice. And uh, I hate that show. Those guys are jerks. At least it's one of them is. <laughs> Well, you guys told yes. me on that show, I don't know if you remember this, but you told me, go out and network with as many people as you can. And so I started meeting people for lunch. I started meeting people for coffee in the morning. I started meeting people for beers after work. And one day I happened to run into Mr. Dorkin here uh, while networking with some real estate investors. So Yeah, actually, it was, it was more like, you know, I was at work and you creeped <laughs> up on my office and like totally fanboyed and it was freaky and you were like oh my god that's and exactly I, what he it was did. like uh sir can you please go away <laughs> yep and then I, and then i didn't i followed up probably like three or four more times you know no, it was great it was great so. <laughs> okay so but yeah so yeah keep going keep going how'd you get into oh real so then? yeah one thing led to another and uh i followed up a few more times i got an interview with you guys and uh Progressed my real estate investing, um, got a job here at Bigger Pockets, and company's grown, my portfolio's grown, personal finance position has grown, and uh, yeah. All right. Cool. Well, so so speaking of that, you know, like as, as we talked about earlier, today's kind of a different type of show um, for a few reasons. We we've got you on here. Um, you do have this book coming out that that we alluded to, um, uh, and. You know, so we we wanted to have you on the show not only b because of the book, um, but you know we've got so many users on the site who, you know, they're excited. They they learn about real estate and and they're ready to go. The problem is they're not financially ready, and you know we, you know we thought it would be really appropriate to put together this book. You were super excited about it, and you're absolutely the single most passionate person about getting your financial ducks in a row that I've ever met, and so we thought. It'd be great. Um, so, you know, we're we're gonna dive into that stuff in a, in a couple of minutes. Let let's quickly run through your actual real estate. Why why you started buying real estate specifically um, quickly, and then dive into that first deal. And then, you know, I I really want to frame everything that we talk about in terms of, you know, what other people need to be thinking about while they're building out their personal financial histories while they're, while they're making decisions on how they're going to live their lives and on how they're going to invest their portfolio. Uh, so let, let's just, you know, as we, as we talk through this, you know, think about things in that frame of reference. Sure. So, you, you know, my goal, as soon as I started, as soon as I realized I don't want to spend the next 30 years doing this kind of work or 40 years, however long that, that, you know, a typical career lasts, um, I decided I wanted to replace my wage income with passive income, and you know I, did, I explored several means to do that. As a full-time employee, it seemed to me that real estate was an incredible way to build semi-passive wealth, wealth where I could spend some work and some energy after hours and still achieve a really scalable return. And so the way I decided to do that is, you know, I started out with nothing. I had maybe three grand when I started my first job, um, which is wonderful. Many people start out with actually a lot of debt, but you know, I was like, how do I go from this position to early financial freedom rapidly while working a full-time job? And in order to do that, the first thing that kind of struck my mind is, well, my rent, my housing expense um, is my biggest single thing that's holding me back from saving and accumulating more wealth. How do I eliminate that? And so I actually read a, a, a nice article by Mr. Turner here um, <laughs> called uh, How to Hack Your Housing and Get Paid to Live for Free, I think it was called. Um, that was maybe three, four years ago. Um, and I was like, this is it. Bingo. What I can do is I can move into a owner-occupied duplex with just 5% down. That was $12,000 um, uh, for my first property. I'll get to the details of that in a minute. Um, and I can wipe out my, my, my mortgage and rent expense, my housing expense entirely. So I immediately set about saving as much as I possibly could so I could make that a reality as soon as, as, soon as possible. Um, so that first year, I worked hard. Um, saved as much as possible, brought lunch to work every day, um, did all that kind of stuff, and saved up about 20 grand on my 
just under fifty thousand dollar a year salary. Um, and with that twenty grand, I used that to buy a, a two hundred and forty thousand dollar duplex up in about November two thousand fourteen. Um, fixed it up, got a tenant on the other side, got a roommate to uh, help me out with with my side. They're both two bed, one baths. Um, and so at the time, I was paying a mortgage of fifteen fifty, receiving eleven fifty. Uh, in rent from tenants, and then 550 for my roommate. So I was, you know, eking out 150 bucks there, and that pro- I probably broke even after all the utilities and those kinds of expenses. That's awesome. That's awesome. So yeah, that that's that concept of house hacking, which um, that article way back in the day was kind of what started that that phrase. Uh, which now I hear people all the time saying house we, hacking. We coined we coined yeah, right? the phrase, yeah, and now like, every everybody's using it. It's yeah. wild. All right. So you decided to house hack this property. I have a couple questions about that. First of all. Is house hacking for anybody, do you think? Or is it for guys like you, single, uh, you know, young? Like, is that the only people that's good for that? So I think it's most appealing to guys like me that are kind of single and young. But I think it, it works for anyone. And what I encourage, you know, if you're looking to achieve early financial freedom, regardless of who you are, buying a house, a home, a primary residence that stretches yourself to your your financial limits. You know, let's say if you make 80k a year, 85k a year, and you buy a $400,000 property, I mean, that is going to devastate your ability to progress towards early financial freedom. You're not going to be able to save anything. Um, you're not. You're going to wipe out most of your cash position, most likely, on that purchase, and it's just going to be a years-long slog to really get back into position to uh, begin saving rapidly and, and investing in real estate, for example. Um, if you house hack, even if you just, you know, you don't have to house hack forever. If you just house hack a few times, you really set yourself up with a lot of pa- uh, passive cash flow. It's a really easy way to get involved in real estate investing. And then you can use those former house hacks to buy that primary residence. So that's that's my plan. And I understand why that's particularly appealing to me as a kind of a young single guy. But for a family, I think it works really well for, it could work really well for a family as well. Many of my tenants, for example, are families. You know, yeah. what's the difference between them uh, living in this place as a tenant and versus a, as a house hacker. Well, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars in wealth over, you know, a decade or so. Yeah. You know, yeah. one of my, one, sc- oh, sorry. Go ahead, bro. I was gonna say one of my buddies out here in, in Olympia, Washington, his name's Carrie. He's got four kids and they bought a duplex. They lived in half, but fixing it up. Then they just bought a second duplex. They moved from the one to the other one. I mean, like they're, they've house hacked both these. They have a ton of equity building cash flow in it. And now they can go out and buy their, you know, dream house, so to speak, if they wanted to. And they could even use the cash flow from those properties to cover their mortgage on their dream house. Uh, And so it can be done by somebody with a family. I I love it. That leads into what I was going to ask Scott. And so, Scott, you said you were going to parlay that first house hack. You parlayed that first house hack into into the next house hack. How how does that work? Is there like a time frame uh, under which you should be holding on to, to that first property? Or can you just go from one to the next to the next and, and keep getting these deals? Or is there a strategy behind, um, you know, moving up to the next house hack? Well, you know, I think when you're starting out into, in, a, in the game of wealth creation, especially if you make a median income, like 50, you know, 50K, around 50K a year, like I was, um, maybe a little bit more, um, it's really hard to start accumulating the wealth that you need to rapidly to purchase you know, multiple investment properties, at least in certain parts of the country. I know in Podunk, Washington, where Brandon is, you know, you can save that up in just a few months. But uh, here in Denver, you know, wow, you buy ripping, a, ripping a on property. me already. Wow. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, but here in Denver, if you want to buy, you know, a normal property, you know, it's three hundred grand. So that's seventy-five thousand dollars if you're trying to put twenty-five percent down. That's a lot of money. That can take years to to save up. Yeah. Um, as a as a house hacker. You know, you can the the advantage is you can put down a very small down payment. Like for in my example, I put down twelve thousand dollars on that two hundred forty thousand dollar property. How so well, low, by the way? How'd you end up doing it so low? It, the reason for that is because because I used an FHA loan, and that goes right back to your question, which is you know how frequently can you do this? Well, once a year <laughs> is basically the answer, and the reason why is because the FHA loan or these low down payment conventional loans typically ask you to live in that property for at least a year as part of as part of the deal. Part of the, the advantage of getting such a, uh, getting access to financing with such a low down payment is you have to live there for a year. And I I kind of look at that as just like hey, I'm signing a lease for a year, except this lease is actually going to let me build a lot of wealth. And once that year is up, you actually are in a far greater uh, far more advant- advantageous position than other homeowners and renters in your area because you're now the owner of an investment property. Unlike a homeowner, you can move out and you know you're going to get a cash a cash flow 
um, a cash flowing rental property as soon as you move out. Well, you know, as long you, as you bought it well. As long as you bought it well, yes. So you're, you're, this is, you know, I'm specifically referring to the case of buying an investment property um, that would make sense as a rental from day one as a house hack. Um, but if you do that, you have this really advantageous position. Again, you have that option to rent it out. You have the option to continue living happily there, assuming you bought in a place that you're happy to live in. And you have the option to sell it. Most people only have one or two of those options. You have all three. So it's actually fairly low risk, um, but you do have to live there for, for at least a year. So what do you suggest to people who, who want to do that? And they want to, they want to do this, they'll say three or four times, but FHA only allows you to have one FHA loan at a time. And so like, what are your suggestions? Should somebody refinance or what's, what's the plan if you wanted to do it multiple times? Think of it like a, like a burr strategy. And you know, you buy, you fix it up, you know, you, you buy a rehab, you rent out the other side, um, you rent out your side when you move out and then you refinance out of the FHA loan. And hopefully you've built some equity. Yeah. Um, if not, you know, there's a couple of things that are working together to help you kind of reach that 20, 25% equity mark um, in that property. One is if you buy a, a house hack that needs some work in it, you can improve the value, you can increase the value through some forced appreciation. Two, you're not paying any rent anymore. So you know, you hopefully you're living for free and able to save a lot more money. You can use that to kind of buy your way out of the, out of the FHA loan. Um, and then uh, three, you know, I, I, if, you're, if, you, if you're in a good market, you know, Denver happened to appreciate a lot and I got a lot of help, um, help from that front to help me with the refinance. That makes so sense. The, the combination of those three things really helps out. And then what happens is that gives you access to another FHA loan. So that, get, that in effect, you know, let's, let's use Denver as an example again. You know, you're trying to buy another $240,000 duplex. You're going to need 25% of that. That's 60K. Or you can refinance out of the FHA loan and now you can just put down 12K. Yep. So it's in effect, it's like giving yourself an extra $48,000 of purchasing power um, if That's you can cool. refinance out of that. Stop with your voodoo magic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and of course there are other loans as well. I mean, like I know some banks now. I'm mean, this maybe is a a scary sign, but I mean, there's banks today doing five percent down conventional loans, three percent down Absolutely. conventional loans. So that's not starting FHA. to come back. It's starting. Yeah. To come you don't back. Have, yeah, that's that's correct. So and, and yeah. one more. I just learned that the other day. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. One more thing just to add on to that. One of my favorite ways to house hack, and you and I have talked about this before, is what's called the 203K loan or 203K loan. It's part of the FHA program, but it allows you to wrap in the repair costs into that 3.5% down payment. So let's say you buy the house for 200 and you need 50 grand. Well, normally a guy would need 25% down plus the 50 grand. I mean, they're going to come up with 100 grand at the end of the day, right? But if you're house hacking, they take the 200, add the 50 to it, you got 250. And you pay just three and a half percent down of that entire two fifty. So it's like taking the burr strategy and house hacking and marrying them together and making this beautiful baby. Love it. I, I love it. Yeah, I love it. And and for me, you know, I didn't use a two or three K loan because I wanted to, you know, do a lot of the work myself. And because I'm a little bit of a wussy and didn't want to take on such a big project with one <laughs> yeah. of my first purchases. But yeah, I absolutely that's a great strategy. Very cool. Nice. Very cool. Nice. Yeah, that's great. Um, so Scott, in, in terms of house hacking, I mean, you're in Denver, right? Denver is one of the hottest real estate markets in the entire country. It's it's expensive. Um, there's a heck of a lot of competition. In fact, uh, some somebody uh, at the office here was was looking at a duplex. They said I believe there were 17 or 27 um, offers on a property that they had looked at within like a day or two. So. How does one, how does one find a market to to house hack in? Can you still house hack in a market like Denver? Can you house hack in San Francisco, New York, uh, the, these tougher markets, or uh, not not so much right now when the markets are really screaming? So you know, I, there's I'm, I'm going to answer this in a roundabout way with some philosophy here. So <laughs> my philosophy is, you know, <laughs> where am I going to be the best off in thir- thirty years from now, right? Where's gonna where which where property is gonna be more valuable than they are today in 10, 20, 30 years, and you know I think there's a couple of cities around the country that are, that that are showing some growth that people want to move there because they they just want to move there because they're a great city. You know you talk about Seattle, Portland, Austin, Texas, um, and Denver, Colorado. I think is right up there, and you know I believe strongly in the long term prospects of Denver, Colorado, and. I think it's really hard. I think it's really it's really easy to, you know, predict the financials of a business or real estate investment over six months to a year. You know, it's a short time frame that you can easily predict. I also think it's 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 fairly possible to predict the long term outcomes of certain markets over thirty years. What's really difficult is kind of getting those cycles right. 
uh, in the five, seven, ten year time frame. So, is Denver in a cycle, in a part of a cycle right now where it's impossible to find a deal? I don't know. The market could climb for another five, six years before it, before it dips, and you know, even at the bottom of the next cycle, I might still be better off buying today than if and if I you know waited until until the next correction. So, so the reason I think that Denver is a, a, a place to purchase is because if you earn even around the median income, you can still buy property here. And if you believe in the long-term fundamentals of the city, I think that if you dollar cost average, and by that I mean buying one property every year so that you're, you're not buying at the top or the bottom of any one cycle, that you'll do all right. And the, the biggest key is to maintain cash flow. My first rental property produces $2,600 a month in mortgage uh, uh, and gross rent, and the mortgage is $1,400 per month. That's $1,200 per month uh, over the debt service, right? Now, I don't buy the 50% rule. You know, I think my expenses come out to about more of like four or $500 a month on this property. Um, but that's a, either way, that's a stable cash flowing investment. I'm not going to lose my shirt investing uh, in that type of property. And if I can average that out and continue to, to, to buy property that produces cash flow, um, I believe I'm going to benefit from the long-term appreciation in this market. Yeah, I love that. And you know, yeah. you know, one thing like that I love about bigger pockets in general, kind of like the spirit of BP, is how like everyone learns from one another. And why I say that is because you know, yes, I I wrote that the you know the post on house hacking that Scott learned from and then did that thing. But I've learned probably more from Scott than he's learned from me. And this is one of the things that I picked up oh, from yeah. Scott. Yeah, is this idea of like. Um, you know, I invest in, in Podunk, Washington. A lot of my stuff is here. Uh, but me and Scott I mean, have talked for hundreds of hours, if not thousands of hours, about real estate stuff. And, uh, wow. you know, I, and I, I'm paying you to do yeah, something you're else. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And, How about you that? Know, I got, <laughs> <laughs> it's all after hours, Jack. Yeah, yeah, it's all after hours. Oh, yeah, hours, yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, but like, I've really come around to this idea of like, when I asked Scott, you know, like, well, what if the Denver market crashes? I mean, his answer is always like, well, do you think it's going to come back? I mean, it's Denver. It's a nice market. And I'm, I'm more and more convinced that when you look for a solid, stable, growing market, you don't have to necessarily worry, oh, what if it drops a little bit in the next time? What if the cycle, I hit it at the wrong point? You know, like buy good properties in great areas and you're going to likely be fine uh, on yeah. average. At, at good value, though. I mean, yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. And, and I know we're Absolutely. talking long term cycles, but like, you know, if Scott had had paid for whatever the, the, the property he was just talking about and if his note was, you know, twenty five hundred or three thousand a month. Yeah. You know, suddenly he's probably overpaying a little bit, or you know, at least relative to the rents that he can achieve. And 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 so you know, granted, he can achieve wealth over time through pay down, you know, uh, of of his mortgage and and you know, uh, ta tax benefits. But you you know, what if he had paid three thousand? What if he was upside down? You know, and a lot of people find themselves in that position because they're just not thinking about these things. Yeah, my philosophy is definitely. Go in a long in a market where you believe strongly in the long term profits, uh, pot profit potential, and abide by these three rules. First, make sure that you win if the market continues going up, by being invested. Second, make sure you win uh, if the market remains flat and there's no appreciation. And third, make sure you win if the market goes down. So if you do those three things, you're pretty much covered. So if the market goes down, I'm in position to buy a lot more real estate um, through through my personal financial position outside of real estate investing. Talk, and, talk about winning while the market goes down on on your holdings. And and I, I think it's an important discussion that we don't really talk about a lot on the podcast. You know, people assume, okay, well I've got I'm making X amount of rent and, you know, that's enough to do okay. So, you know, I paid I paid I was smart one on the buy side. And and, you know, I make a hundred bucks a door after everything's said and done. That's great. But that assumes that rents aren't going to go down when the market and if the market goes down, right? Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, sometimes people can find themselves in a position where they've bought a property, you know, okay, it looks good on paper when everything's good, but when things turn, even though they were smart in how they bought it, they were not anticipating that rents could drop. And so, you know, maybe immediately you're, you're tied into somebody, but they go and they see, you know what, I'm paying X amount of rent. I could go somewhere else, get the same or better property for less because rents have started to drop. Now you've got to go refill that. And now your rent out drops. Suddenly you start to bleed. So how, how does, you know, 
obviously if ever the markets tank tremendously and all rents ever you know rents go down you're in trouble but is there any kind of way to to protect yourself from that so here's my philosophy rule number one i have a lot of cash so i have a lot of cash saved up that i've accumulated over the years i i purchase very conservatively i'm not extending myself to my absolute financial limits to buy real estate so i could survive for a year two years maybe if if rents you know even if i wasn't able to get a tenant in there at all uh into either of my properties so that's the first rule the sec the second rule is uh, you know, set yourself up for opportunity when that when that market crash comes, right? And again, I think that that partially comes through with that cash position because, hey, let's say the market crashes, right? Sure, I might be out on my current properties. They might not produce a great cash flow if the rents drop. I might lose my equity, but now I can buy more property at a great price, and that's again because of my personal financial position outside of real outside of uh, my current real estate portfolio. And then the second piece is kind of generally what I'm doing, how the, my work ethic and what I'm trying to do with my um, career and, and uh, things involved in real estate, that will also help set me up for success in the event of a market crash. I've got That's a track awesome. record. Um, I, I got my real estate license to help me with my real estate, with, with my business. Um, everybody I know, every single person I know, knows that I love real estate and love talking about it, perhaps to the point of a little bit of annoyance. Uh, but <laughs> Never. <laughs> I hope I hope that if the market crashes, I'm putting myself in, in a position such that people will be like, all right, Scott's saying it's now it's now time to buy. It's time to buy. Let's go ahead and get in, involved there and and take advantage of the opportunities in that market. So I think those are the two ways to set yourself up for success uh, if the market goes sour. Love it. Right. Awesome. So, you know, and, and Scott, that's your philosophies. I think are why Brandon has spent hundreds or thousands of hours talking to you. They're, they're the reasons I've spent yep. probably hundreds or thousands of hours talking to you probably on the clock too, um, <laughs> about these things. And, and they're the reason why the book is something that I'm super excited about. And, and, um, you know, we're, we're so proud to get behind because, you know, as young as you are, I don't think I've ever met a, another person as, um, well put together from a um, mental perspective um, as it pertains to wealth building, personal finance. You know, granted, your your inability to pick stocks is astounding. <laughs> um, but be, beyond that, um, the, the the philosophies are, are are fantastic. So so you got this book coming out. we want we want to talk about some of the themes in the book. Can you give us a quick thirty second overview of the book and share with us in your opinion? What's the best way for someone to become set for life at a young age? Awesome. So the the goal of the book is to help someone that's from a standing start with little to no assets, who works a full-time job earning around immediate income, uh, help them uh, move rapidly towards early financial freedom. And we do that through three stages. The first stage is kind of accumulating that first year of what I call financial runway. So for example, um, and, and you do this through, uh, mostly through frugality in, in, the, in the first stage. What is you that? Save, frugality, saving. Okay. saving. Um, so the, the, for example, a year of financial runway might be if you spend $3,000 a month, that might be $36,000 per year in cash. If you have $36,000 per year in cash and no debts and your expenses are $3,000 per month, you can begin to take some risks. You can buy a property uh, like a house hack. You can maybe quit your job and pursue a job that offers a lower base pay, um, but offers more opportunity, you know, for example, like a real estate agent. Um, and then that brings us to stage two, which is going from that kind of one year of financial runway to maybe four or five years of financial runway. And I kind of bench that as the $100,000 mark. So if you have $100,000 in cash, readily accessible wealth, you know, it doesn't have to be in the bank. It could be in stocks or bonds or something that you can easily withdraw from. You now have exponentially more, more options. You can go and start a business. You can buy a really significant investment or an outright rental property with 25% down. Um, you could, you know, take it, take a few years off and go and become an entrepreneur. And then that brings us from the, the to the third stage of the book, which is going from the first $100,000 or four to five years in financial runway to early financial freedom. And you finish out the journey by honing your investment philosophy, uh, buying assets, buying, building, and and uh, and otherwise acquiring assets that produce passive cash flow 
um, and satisfying the, the financial freedom equation. That's there great. That's All great. Right. But go ahead. Go ahead, Brandon. Well, I was going to say, I want to dive into the, you, you talked about the kind of the three phases, the, the first $25,000, that phase. I wanted to go there. Is that cool, Josh? Are we, are we good to go yeah, there? Absolutely. All right. Yeah, you can go wherever you want to go. Right, I mean, right. what, what do you, <laughs> since when do you ever ask for my permission I, to I do anything? I usually don't. I usually don't. So, no, no, all right. So, no. in here, in the, in the book, you say Never. You, you just you, keep just doing do. what you want to do. It's how we roll. <laughs> it's, you know, I, I believe in the beginning, you're like, no, podcasts suck. We don't want a podcast. I just did it anyway, and I forced you. I right. tied you to your chair and actually, you're, connected you're a mic wrong to you. And about we, that. We made that's this incorrect. Yeah, this so, podcast is a disaster. <laughs> that's for sure. Yes, <laughs> clearly. And, and, I, and, and yes, I, I was a thousand percent against doing a podcast. No. What's wrong with you? <laughs> all right. So, going back to our, uh, our guest, because it's not all about you, Josh. Uh, no, you say in the book, Scott, that wealth <laughs> creation begins with frugality. It's in the section on the, how to get to that first $25,000, which for a lot of people listening to the show right now, they're like, $25,000 seems like a lot of money. I could never get there. You know, that's going to take me yep. 20 years to get there. Uh, and so, uh, why but they are you, rocking some brand new kicks, aren't they? They are rocking some brand new kicks. Driving a, a decent car, phrase. aren't they? They yep. are. They got right, their so, little Starbucks habit, don't they, <laughs> Turner? I love my Starbucks. So, all right. So why does wealth creation begin with frugality? And honestly, isn't frugality just not very fun? So frugality, <laughs> well, when I say this, well, remember, this book is written for a full-time employee earning a salary, right? Okay. When you earn a salary, uh, it's not to say it can't be done. It's just, to, it's just that it's fairly inefficient. It's often inefficient to attempt to earn dramatically more income from, that, from, that, from those hours. You know you're going to get more or less paid that, that paycheck um, if you show up and do your job well, Right. So you have to focus somewhere else on building that year of financial runway so that you can begin to take risks. So frugality, um, the wealth creation journey begins with frugality for the full-time employee uh, and not necessarily, you know, for someone like, like you, Brandon, who, you know, went, became a full-time entrepreneur and built a real estate empire, right? Sure. And the reason why it begins with frugality is because most, you know, many, many users on Bigger Pockets, many, many of our listeners they have great jobs. They're making 50, 60, 80K a year, maybe more, and they want to get started investing in real estate. Well, why can't they invest in real estate? It's, it, it's because they have no cash. It's because they have no ability to accumulate their, their you know, preserve their paycheck. And so if you can start preserving that one, two, three thousand dollars $3,000 per month at a time, you'll rapidly build out, again, that first year of financial one way and begin to get exposure to opportunities that will allow you to increase your income and by significant investments. Can you explain that a little bit? Like, because I, I love this point that that you and I again have talked about this before, and I want everyone to understand like what you mean here by that financial runway, and then you can take risks. What are you What are you talking about? So, for example, in, in my case, right, I spent my first year building up that first twenty thousand uh, dollars, which for me was a year of financial runway because I was spending less than two thousand dollars per month uh, on my lifestyle, and with that first twenty thousand dollars, I was able to do two things at the same time. The first was I was able to buy a house hack, right? And the second was because my spending was so low and I had a cash cushion, I was able to quit my uh, boring job that I didn't like previous to Bigger Pockets and join this fantastic startup that was helping millions of people uh, achieve financial freedom through real estate. And it's not going to get you any bonus points, man. Don't don't. <laughs> Fair enough, but you know, opportunities flowed from that decision, and you know. That, that kind of, th those kind of options present themselves once you have cash saved up and are able to, serve, uh, able to live happily. This is not about you know, living like a hermit, but if you can live happily on a small amount per month, you can take advantage of different job opportunities that can offer scale. Yeah. So, so you know, I know one of the things that you've, you talk about is you know, uh, finding jobs like commission jobs, like sales jobs, things like that, things that can potentially expand um, your ability to earn is one path. Um, and th there are other paths also in cutting down on expenses is probably one of the biggest ones that I think a lot of people have the ability to do, but oftentimes don't know how to or don't want to. Um, so can, let, can we talk about that a little bit? How, how do people cut back and particularly, you know, somebody like you, you're a single guy, you know, you can cut back on booze and drinking and partying with the ladies and you know, that that's one path. And <laughs> yeah. you know. Scott sounds like he has such a wild life. 
Hey, that's um, the biggest part. Did, of have you book. have you met Frat Boy <laughs> Scott? Yeah. Um, the, the, but what about somebody who's a little tighter? Somebody who has you know student loan debt? Somebody who has some of these other issues? Um, are you know is there? Where would somebody start when it comes to cutting down on their expenses? Okay, so and I have a whole chapter in the book that's specifically re- uh, uh, dedicated to how to cut major expenses from a typical American budget. And so where do we start when we're looking at how to cut expenses and, and begin to save aggressively? Well, you start by looking at the biggest areas of your, of your spending. And, you know, you made this point, you know, you, you know booze, right? Or, or let's say, let's call it coffee in the morning, you know, lattes at Starbucks. A lot of people tell you to, hey, I want to cut out, you need to cut out those, those, those lattes or that, you know, happy hour every week that you spend with your friends. Well, you know, that's baloney in my opinion, because that's, you know, a small fraction of most people's spending. Where is people, where is your money really going? If you're an average American, if you're a typical person, your money's really going to your house and mortgage payment or your rent. It's really going to your transportation costs and specifically your, your, your expensive car, um, you know, $30,000 plus vehicle. It's really going to your, your eating out budget. You know, when you order lunch, you know, three or four times a week and that that adds up over the time and you can live just as happily on on food that you prepare yourself. That's delicious from the grocery store. Those are where your expenses I've eaten are your really food before. Good. It's not that good. <laughs> uh, well, you know, <laughs> well, so real, real quick, to, to something just occurred to me, like something we had on the show a few, I don't know, a month back or whatever. Perry, uh, Perry Marshall uh, yep. who talked about the 80 20 rule um, about how like. And I just never really put these two together, but in your expenses, it's probably the same way. Like most of your expenses are probably situated in a few small things you have. Like you said, eating lunch every day out, uh, your mortgage, your car payment is probably 80% of your entire you know, spending right there versus the $5 latte. Absolutely. You know, I, I just listened to that podcast the other day and, you know, while I didn't reference the 80, 20 rule, I, I, you know, I, in the chapter, I break it up like, Hey, 80% of the average American spending is in the categories of housing, transportation, food, health insurance, and pensions. And well, you know, there's maybe not that much you can do about the health insurance piece. There's a lot you can do about the 50% of your budget that is housing, transportation, and food. Actually, it's, I think it's more like two thirds. So, and then the other 20% is going to be your entertainment expense or your, you know, education expense. Um, even though that could be, you know, a big thing for someone with student loans, for example, um, for the average American, those are those are not big parts of their budget. So focusing your efforts on cutting out spending there is largely a waste of time, and it's going to it's not going to result in a material difference in your uh, the speed at which you approach financial freedom. But Scott, I I need my car and my car payment, my forty thousand dollar Lexus, so I can drive to work every day because I have to earn a living. And my wife needs her car and her forty thousand dollar loan you know, to drive to work as well. Like, are you telling us that we should not have cars? So this is where frugality becomes a, um, and I don't have a 40,000 uh, Lexus. It's, it's, it's a journey, right? It's a, it's a journey, you know, just like building wealth through real estate, designing an efficient, awesome, low cost lifestyle is also a journey you have to undertake. And it usually takes, you know, at least in my experience, six months to a year, maybe a little longer to fully make the changes necessary to begin preserving a huge amount of your income while giving up basically no happiness. Yeah. So yeah. for example, in your, you know, in my case, you know, I, I start off driving to work, you know, over 10 miles every day because that, that's what they could do. I started out of college, got a car and, and did that. Well, as soon as I kind of developed this mindset, I began making subtle changes. You know, I moved my, you know, I first moved my work closer to home. I was looking deliberately for jobs that were closer to where I lived at the time. Bigger pockets was less than five miles uh, between my, my home and my work. And so I was able to begin biking to work. And then when I had accumulated enough to buy my first house hack, I made sure that that was also close to work so that I could really cut out my commuting cost um, for, for that exact reason. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, you know, it's it's interesting. And, you know, it, it takes work to do this. I, I remember when, when we first moved out to, to Colorado, you know, we had bought a house and, you know, realized that, like, why do we need two cars? What, you know, like it would be easier if we had two cars, you know, we can both, my wife and I can, can both go where we want to, when we want to, but we, for, we, you know, we, we gave that up, you know, it was like, let's, let's be a single car family for a while. 
um, and save on the money. We still needed a car because, you know, proximity, because we needed to, to go and get stuff and had a kid and all this, these other things. But, um, you know, making that conscious decision to cut out in different ways, like, you know, it's, it's not about being cheap, right? It's somewhat about being thrift. It's thrifty and cheap, I guess, are, are, are kind of different, but like, it's just about being smart. Right. You know, you, you could still go take your friends to dinner once in a while. You can still do this. But like, you know, we have this discussion at work all the time. Like all of a sudden we'll look and we're like, like, oh, everybody in the office, we've all been going out to eat like four days this week. And then we stop. And we're like, what are we doing? We, we just spent, you know, a hundred, hundred dollars this week eating out, you know, and, and we, if we had packed our own food, we would have saved that money. You know, that's a few hundred bucks a month that you now pack away. Everybody listening to the show does this. Everybody does it. So um, think about yeah, these, these different ways. And I think that lunch lunch out is a perfect example. If you go out, you know, there's no benefit to really going out to eat lunch, especially by yourself or with, you know, uh, the, the same folks that you go out with every day. It's great to hang out with them, but you can, you can, you can bring that into the office or do that at, do that at home. And, and I'm not saying to cut out the weekly happy hour, you know, I'm not, I'm saying to cut out the weekly happy hour, but I'm not saying to cut out the going out with your friends kind of thing. You know, I love going out with my friends and I'll be happy to go and have a nice dinner on the weekend, but that's not my default option. My default option is to prepare my own food for breakfast, lunch, and dinner and to make it healthy and reasonable. And that's just a great way to save. And Josh, you're talking about how you used to be, um, pretty, pretty thrifty, um, well, I'd argue that that has exposed you to the ability to build, you know, in part to build a large business and well, be that's in the where I was going to go out today. Yeah, yeah abso- absolutely. Had I not done that, um, and and I got off track, and thank you for bringing me back to to my actual point. Um, <laughs> bigger pockets wouldn't be here because I wouldn't have been able to hire that first guy. I wouldn't have been hired to able to hire the contract. I wouldn't have been able to hire Brandon to come and join the company um, as the first employee. I mean, it, it none of those things would have happened if I was uh, not. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. So, so well, I can't. Um, if I could jump in there too, like the same thing. Like I wouldn't have been able to accept the job. I mean, like, and I, I'm not saying this to be rude at all, but like uh, my initial pay was not a, a whole ton of money, right? But you didn't have a ton of money at the time. I didn't right. need a whole ton of money at the time. We Correct. worked like, but both of us were frugal. And so we made this work and we grew, you know, like, so again, like I think in, in all three of our cases, the exact same story was there. Like, because we were responsible financially, we were able yeah. to make that risk, which was us having you expand on earlier. I, I love I, that. One, one of the things that, you know, since we're talking about, um, saving money and being thrifty. One of the expenses that I tend to see not only young people, but folks of all ages, um, blow cash in a way that is just astounding to me. My, my wife doesn't, doesn't drink. She doesn't drink at all. And, and so, um, once we got together, you know, my desire to go out drinking, you know, pretty much went to zero. I'll have an occasional drink, but, um, I noticed when we were going out to a nice restaurant, my bill was, you know, close to half of those of other couples that we would go with, who were buying glasses of wine, bottles of wine, beers, all this. Let's just let's just split the, let's just split the, split the bill evenly then. <laughs> Don't you love those yeah, conversations? I, oh yeah, that was always fun. But but <laughs> I just yeah, ordered I mean, a salad. Come on. You know that to me is one of the just easiest easiest ways that people can save is like yeah, have a drink bef- before, have a drink when you get home. You know you know, drinking out is so expensive. Um, and it could consume just an absolute ton of money for, for a lot of people. I know a lot of people who, if they were just to cut out their, their drinking expense, and these are people in their thirties and forties, and these are not alcoholics either. Um, you know, they'd suddenly have a lot more money in their pockets. And and, and I, I'll, you know, I, I enjoy, you know, some beers and some wine on the weekends. Um, and I, I, I'm happy to spend that money, but I buy it from the liquor store and I'll have it with some friends at home over, over dinner that we prepare. Right. Uh, if I do go out, you know, well, I don't really do this that much anymore, but you know, back in the day, you know, you'd pregame before you go out, you drink, you drink some beers beforehand and that way you wouldn't have to spend so much money at the restaurant or at the bar or whatever, you know, if, if you're going, if you really wanted to go out and, and have some drinks. And so it's just, it's, you can do all of these things, just be smart about how you do it and understand the cost of these things. Yeah. So, for sure. For sure. Cool. All right. So, you know, we, we, we've been chatting for a bit. 
um, about you. Obviously, this you know we would be doing ourselves a disservice if if we didn't take a chance to to plug the book here. So the book is called Set for Life: Dominate Life, Money, and the American Dream. You, Scott, are the title. It's available in hardcover, ebook, audio. Scott, Scott is the author. He's not the title. What did I say? Did <laughs> I call him Scott, the title? You called him the title. You know. Oh, uh, yeah, Scott. my title is uh, Trench Author. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Scott, you're the author. Um, the book's going to be available for $29.99 in hardcover. That's our first um, hardcover book, which I'm super excited about. This is our first hardcover book, yeah. Sorry, Brandon. Um, whatever, and then, uh, whatever, whatever. Uh, it'll be available in audiobook, $9.99 as an ebook, uh, launching Sunday, April 23rd. And it is available for pre order now from Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, IndieBound, or ask for it to be ordered at your local bookstore and library. That would be amazing. Otherwise, um, it's available to order on all three sites as of April 23rd. Um, Scott, do you want to you talk for a second about the bonuses that we're going to offer? Yeah, with absolutely. This thing? So, um, if you buy in the first week or if you pre-order, you're going to get some uh, exclusive bonuses that will only be available uh, for free with, with the launch in the first week here. And those bonuses are going to include things like a six-part series on how to uh, eliminate or reduce your debt. The second, the second part of the, the second bonus is going to be interviews with various um, personal finance experts. We're specifically focusing on folks that are in their you know, mid to late 20s that have experienced incredible career success retired early in their 20s or have um, or, or have done some kind of unique things with their frugality and lifestyle design. Um, and then the third bonus is going to be the audiobook, with, uh, which will be recorded um, by me, and that'll be free and included with the purchase of the hardcover in the first week there. Awesome. And so again, this is for anybody who pre-orders or orders in the first week. We really want to emphasize that like uh, after the first week is up, you can buy this for, you know, not all the bonuses will be included and it's going to be a lot more expensive. If you buy it during the first week on Amazon or on one of the sites we mentioned, uh, you will get all those bonuses, but you do have to email us uh, at set for life, S E T F O R L I F E at biggerpockets.com uh, with your receipt during that first week. And we will make sure you get all uh, the goodies. So again, that is set for life at biggerpockets.com. Just email your receipt to us and we will uh, get you all those bonuses ASAP. We're trying oh, to get on the bestseller list. We are yeah. trying to get on the bestsellers list. You know? Yeah. So those, those sales in that first week really count because uh, it's, it's one week that you need to, to sell in to, to make a list like that. And if you also, also, I forgot to mention, if you buy in that first week, um, we'll have an exclusive uh, house hacking webinar for folks that bought in that first week or pre-ordered, um, where I'll walk you through uh, lots of the concepts that are involved in house hacking, my specific case, and uh, a lot of the numbers and how that works out and helps you to build wealth. Cool. Nice. And if so, people want to, I was going to say, people want to learn more about the book in general, what it's all about, what's all included, all the packages, everything, uh, go to biggerpockets.com slash set for life, S-E-T-F-O-R-L-I-F-E. And uh, awesome. you can see everything there. Cool. So Scott, who's the book actually written for? I mean, is it is it written for me? Is it written for like old guys? Um, is it written for mountain men like Brandon? Is it you know who 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 did you focus this for? So this book is written for specifically a working professional that earns a middle to upper middle class income, but wants to attain early financial freedom. Um, within five to seven years, or at least make an incredible amount of progress in that amount of time. And we're not just focusing on frugality. Frugality is only the tip of the iceberg. It's the first section. The rest yeah. two thirds of that book are dedicated to the concepts of increasing your income by taking advantage of opportunities and exploiting um, your, the advantages that are unique to your personal situation, and then developing a sound investment philosophy that, uh, that really kind of takes into account risk versus reward um, we talk about diversification. We talk about the core tenets of investing for early financial freedom, how to build a portfolio that will sustain itself uh, indefinitely. And the goal of the book is to help someone that is starting with little to nothing go from that position to early financial freedom in a lasting way. Nice. And, and you know, when I when I look through it, I, I see a book written for folks in, you know, college kids. I see a book written for um, folks in their twenties, I, you know, frankly, I, I know lots of people, 30, 40, 50, 60s who could stand to learn a whole heck of a lot from the book itself. So just because that's kind of the target doesn't mean that you don't stand to learn anything from it. There's, there's so many great nuggets in there. 
Absolutely. And this book is also really great for college students that are about to graduate and want to hit the ground running as soon as they hit their career. There's definitely things you can start immediately from day one as soon as you start earning a salary. Yeah. So. Awesome. Cool. Awesome. Cool. Well, I was going to say, before we uh, before we move forward on the show, I, I, I think it's time, Brandon. It's, ti- it's, it's time for what, Josh? I think it's time for the Random it's time, Five. It's time for it. It's time for it. The Random Five. All right, The Random Five. This is a new section of the show that we've just been introducing lately uh, where we ask five random questions about uh, about our guests just to get you guys to know them a little bit better. Completely not related to real estate or set for life. And uh, why don't, Josh, why don't you kick us off? Ask the first question. Yeah, yeah sounds good. So, uh, Scott, can you give us your best Robert De Niro impression? <laughs> <laughs> you talking to me? <laughs> you, you talking to me? That's pretty good. Scott looks exactly like a young Robert De Niro. So it's this guy. Yeah. <laughs> well, well done, Scott. Well done. All right. <laughs> uh, let's see. Oh, I like this question. Do you stand or do you walk up escalators? And why? All right. So, so this is my pet peeve. If you're the first one in in line to the escalator. You better walk up the escalator. It's fine. To, you don't have to walk past somebody else, or if there's like someone that's like five, six, you know, ten steps ahead of you, you could. It's fine to stand at that point because like, what do you do? Hurry up into their back. But if you're the first person at the like, I have a walking boot on. I just got surgery on my foot a few months ago, and uh, I walked up the stairs of the airport the other day. You know, the, es- the escalator at the airport the other day because I was the first one on. I'm not going to hold up the whole show here. And behind me, some perfectly two-footed, leg, legged guy <laughs> just chilling there with his luggage and holding up the whole hundreds of people. So, All right. Wow. Sorry, okay. that, that's my answer to that one. Wow. <laughs> now, now, now we know what pisses Scott off. Just, just <laughs> if you ever end up on an escalator in front of him, please freeze <laughs> and take a video of it. Um, <laughs> all right. So – do you ever play the lottery? You know, last year the the uh, made the big mega lottery was like half a billion dollars or a billion dollars or something crazy. You ever, do you ever play? I, I threw ten bucks in with some friends last time the lottery. I think it reached a billion or something like that. And so yeah, we we did that. It was fun. Um, and then we didn't win, so we continued <laughs> along with our evening. Nice. There you nice. go. All right. Uh, if you could get a tattoo, or if you got a tattoo, where and what would it be? Oh man, I'm uh, I'm pretty staunchly anti-tattoo here. But if you had, um, you, you you are getting one. We'll say where where is it going to be and what is it? <laughs> it's a picture of your face, Brandon. I know it better be. I might, you know, I might get I might get something. Uh, I, you know, I've been, I'm a lifelong rugger, so I'm a rugby player. So I've played I've played rugby since I was about six years old. I might get you know. Um, a logo of one of my favorite teams, the New Zealand All Blacks, or you know USA Eagles, um, on you know maybe on, on one of my legs. All right, so, All right. right there. We we were really short shorts in rugby, so you, do. you yes. know if you had it had a tattoo there that that only showed when you were playing. He wears the short shorts to uh, to work sometimes. Sadly, <laughs> yeah, it's a great show. Very, very disturbing. Very disturbing. Uh, all right, last question. If you could experience any other culture firsthand. Which one would it be, and what intrigues you about it? So I, I would want to experience New Zealand culture. Um, I would, I would like, but one of one, one thing I definitely want to do um, at some point in the next five, ten years is I want to take a a backpacking trip through um, New Zealand. I want to go see not only the culture but the, the beautiful scenery of there, and I want to kind of uh, live among the sheeple. I mean, the, the people uh, in that yeah. in that country, and and experience some rugby, um, that kind of culture again. I, big passion of mine throughout my life so it's it's one of my favorite places i've ever been it's it's amazing so you'll you'll love it when you do it cool awesome awesome all right so brandon i know you wanted to kind of take the lead on this uh this last section of the show here sure i do okay so one of the things in your uh book you talk a lot about now i'm, I'm a big proponent of this is this idea of you know we talk a lot about frugality already we've talked about that but then you mentioned that some people are maybe better off making more money, right? So let's, let's go and dive into that side of things. We talked about forget, let's talk about how do you make more money. And again, Josh kind of alluded to it earlier with the, maybe a sales job or something like that. But what can you talk to us about? How do you massively increase your income if you're still working a full-time job? Yeah. So, so again, um, 
it's so it's it's ridiculous to attempt to save your way to early financial freedom. It'll take you 10, 15 years, even if you're making, you know, even if you're making 100 K. Um, so that can only be the, the starting point. That's where wealth be- creation begins. Once you've got that first, you know, that financial runway developed, now it's time to begin scaling your income. And you have to you have to make some hard decisions. It's just it's just as difficult um, and it's going to be just as personal as kind of the decisions you may make on that frugality front. But you have to accept, for example, like let's say, let's say you're making 50k a year at a job at a corporation. You know what the next step is at that at that job. You know it's going to be, you know, marketing and marketing specialist two instead of marketing specialist one. You know that pays 57k instead of 50. Well, that's an inefficient way to progress towards early financial freedom if you want to accomplish that goal in a in a moderate number of years, five, seven, ten years. So you have to accept the reality of that situation and go and attempt to find a new line of work that will offer greater opportunity. The cost of this, so the co- and so, you know, a, a good example might be you join a startup or you go into a new career altogether. But you have to understand the cost of that is likely to be a reduction in base salary in the meantime. You're not going to make quite as much from your salary um, if you go and try to get something that will have the potential to scale. So, for example, you join a startup. Let's say your, your salary goes down to 40k. But you now have equity in that startup, or you become a real estate broker and you have no uh, no salary, but you have the potential to earn as much as you can possibly sell. So that's that's kind of the first like the first step. You have to recognize I need to put myself in a position where that will become a reality, and I need to create a financial position before that through frugality, so that that becomes very easy. Yeah, I love it. I love that. Yeah, you know it's interesting. One one of one of my favorite questions that I ask job applicants who who are coming to bigger pockets is if money wasn't an issue if money was irrelevant what would be what would be your dream job what would you be doing and most people have a dream job that's different than the job that they're applying for and and that's okay you know the, the idea of the question is to kind of get to know you know to the to the somebody's base, you know, who are they and what is it really that makes them tick? Um, what's interesting is if you look at most people, most people are doing jobs that they don't want to be doing. You know, there's very few people who actually have a job that they love. And, and what I often run across are people who are m- making lots and lots of money doing jobs they hate or people making not a lot of money at all doing jobs that they hate. And yet both feel trapped. And it's fascinating to see the the folks who are just making incredible amounts of money who feel trapped, um, and and the folks who are not making incredible amount of money feel trapped. And and at the end of the day, you know nobody's trapped to anything really. I mean, obviously there's certain circumstances where you know you can't quit a job because you have medical bills and things like that. And I mean it's so tight that you're just completely locked down for a while. But if you were to apply you know, frugality and some other methodologies, you'd actually, you know, maybe in a year or two be able to change. But, you know, we all forget to look at ourselves and say, you know, do I actually love what I'm doing? Why am I doing this? You know, where am I? Where am I going? Um, and and I, I love the, the ideas behind this book because I think, you know, I don't necessarily think people want to stop and look in the mirror. It's, it's, it's hard, you know, Wait, I'm 45 years old, trapped in a job that I hate. Well, you're actually not. You know, you could go find another opportunity. You never wanted that job in the first place. Go find a job, a different job that maybe you don't like as much. <laughs> you know, that's going to make you more money. And if right? you were, yeah. if you're a frugal and you had some savings, you could make that jump. Yeah. yeah. And if you if you thing. yeah, and if you want to if you want to make that jump, you have to recognize again. Your current position is just, you have to assess reality. Is your current position going to allow you to earn the kind of income you want to earn or not? And if it's not, you need to build a financial base and go pursue an opportunity that does. And you need to put yourself in an environment with high achieving people that will help you uh, achieve your goals. You know, I forget who said it, but you're the average of the five people you associate with most closely. I think that's incredibly true. Yep. And if you associate, if you can put yourself in a position where you're working with your full-time job, your best efforts during the best part of your day um, with other incredible people uh, like Josh Dorkin or, or Brandon Turner, um, I believe that oh, will I help, go that far. Help, help folks become successful really rapidly, you know, uh, the, and they're, they're out there. 
So go find that kind of environment and then expose yourself to luck, right? Income, there is no step-by-step formula to earning more income like there is to, you know, saving, saving your pennies, right? You know if you cut back on expenses, you're going to accumulate more wealth. When it comes to sales or, you know, joining, you know, joining a startup, whatever, the, whatever that is, there's an element of luck involved there. There's an element of chance and you have to expose yourself to that chance and do what you can to increase those odds. Um, so, you know, that, that's, that's how you go about increasing your income. And we go into great detail into exactly how that, how that is achieved and, and what you need to do to put yourself in those kinds of positions in the book. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, one of the other things that I tend to see a lot and especially this, this political season, um, I think it's really come to the forefront is people saying, well, but I don't have the skills to do anything else. And, you know, I, I, I may get, take some flack for this and that's okay. Cause you know, I firmly believe it, but you know, everything I've ever done with bigger pockets, I've, I've taught myself every single skill that I've acquired for bigger pockets, uh, not every single, but almost every skill. I didn't know how to podcast before I, bigger pockets. I didn't know how to create videos. I didn't know how to create a community. I didn't know how to hire people. I taught myself that, you know, I studied, I went, I found books, I found articles, I taught myself. There's people in jobs that say, I don't have any skills. And what I say is, okay, we'll get out and get those skills. Go to the library, go to, you know, there's, there's organizations that help people with career building, you know, think about those things and figure out the skills, you know, the coal miners, you know, who are, you know, trapped in this, this, you know, horrible world where, you know, there's jobs are disappearing and technology is taking over. You know, technology is going to take over all of our jobs. It can take over Scott's job, Brandon's job, my job. All of our jobs are going to go away to technology at some point or some parts of their jobs. So we need to be able to stop, recognize reality because that is reality. These jobs, our jobs, all the jobs, many of the jobs, truck drivers, car, you know, this stuff is all going away in the next 10, 20, 50 years. So what's the next job? What skill can I teach myself? Think about that. And and I believe that acquiring new skills rapidly and improving is the baseline for survival in in the job marketplace. That's the bare minimum needed to keep your current job that might be paying an average salary, right? If you want to scale your income, you have to do that far better than the next guy. And to give you another example of someone who's done this, we have someone at this company who was in a, a career that he felt did not offer good prospects, in a, in a, also in the real estate realm. And so what he did is he went back to school and learned how to become a software engineer. And he's put himself in a position where he has a very good shot at, at uh, creating a six-figure income for himself within four or five years. So that can be done mid-late 30s. Uh, there's no, no, you're never too old to learn new skills. So Yeah, awesome. Awesome. All right, cool. Well, let's shift gears one last time here. And I want to talk about Scott Trench's controversial blog posts. Now, uh, so, <laughs> so Scott is, is a, a frequent blogger of the Bigger Pockets blog, and he writes a lot of articles. And, and me and him back in the day used to kind of be, you know, friendly competitors on, on who can get the most comments on a blog post. I and, think it was you, he, and uh, Ben Labovich. Yeah, yeah. And there was well, a little yeah. three-way battle. <laughs> We've all since lost to Scott. Because Scott gets like a billion and one comments on every blog post because they're all really, really good and controversial. Uh, and so I wanted to talk about a couple of them, especially the titles. That, uh, and I want you to explain kind of what that post was about. I thought that may be kind of fun. Oh, boy. <laughs> all right. So the first one, your first home purchase could be a horrendous financial decision unless. Unless what? What do you mean? All right. So let me give an example here, right? I, I actually wrote a, similar, a post about a similar theme pretty recently. Let's say you make 85k a year and you buy a your lender tells you hey that qualifies you for a $400,000 property. You have $40,000 in lifetime savings and so you put you buy a $440,000 house using your $40,000 in your max purchase. Well, once that happens, you now longer are you, you you no longer have the ability to save cash because you have a huge mortgage payment, right? You've used up all of your cash and you're stuck. You are now in a position where you have to continue working at your job or one that pays a very similar income. You can't, for example, go and take a job that pays 40K a year because you won't be able to cover your mortgage, um, but that might offer more opportunity. So that first home purchase basically screws you over for any type of significant investing you'd want to be doing on the side. 
Before you can begin building wealth, you need to drastically increase your income, wait many years, uh, accumulate many years more of savings, or make or, or sell the place off and start over. On the other side of the thing, you can do what I did, right? And you buy a, you buy a house hack. A year after that, after that purchase, I now have a cash flowing rental property, some equity built up just like the homeowner might, and uh, I I am also I was able to save that entire time thousands of dollars a month relative to my peer, uh, who is making more money than me, but has locked himself into a, a home purchase like that. So yeah. that's when I say if your if your goal is early financial freedom, your first home purchase could be a disastrous decision, uh, if you purchase something that stretches yourself. Controversial. Controversial. We're, by the way, we're gonna uh, we're gonna link to all these articles in the show notes at biggerpockets.com slash show two twenty three. That's biggerpockets.com slash show two two three. All right, next uh, next post. Let's see. Um, investors, don't shoot for a hundred plus properties. Aim for bigger and better with this strategy. All right, so this is a very link with, baity, by the way. Yeah, this is a, this is a, a, a disagreement I have with Brandon, uh, or maybe used to have with Brandon. Maybe he's coming around to my line of thinking. I, I did call you yesterday, and but, I said, Scott, I'm coming around to your thinking. But okay, go ahead. So, so Brandon buys like forty thousand dollar units of uh, a, a property, you know, eighty thousand dollar duplex, one hundred twenty thousand dollar triplex. Right? Uh, in the, <laughs> it's it's almost Detroit. It's like Podunk, Washington State. It's know? actually worse than Detroit, probably. No, Far we're worse. we're we're so much better than Detroit. We don't smell bad. All right, keep going. <laughs> well, so Brandon now has like what, like fifty units or something like that that he's got to manage. He's got to take care of. He's got a uh, you know a certain type of tenant in these units that are probably more management intensive than maybe a nicer place in a different city. And you know, wouldn't it be better? Or my my argument is, wouldn't it be better to have you know maybe, maybe even that same amount of units, but all in five, six, seven properties? that are all in one spot, really easy to manage, really easy to take care of. And wouldn't it be easy to kind of build that slowly in a convenient manner that is really conducive to your personal life? You know, my goal uh, is large amount of passive income that I can consistently scale easily throughout my life, right? There's no end to the game. You just, you know, when a property is, it becomes no longer a meaningful part of my portfolio, I will intend to s sell it off and buy a nice new property that's conducive to what I'm doing at that time. And so my argument is, wouldn't it be better to have fewer properties like that than hundreds of $40,000 rentals that you know, are a pain in the butt? And that's one of the so. things we talked about with- uh, All right, so next question. Well, um, <laughs> we talked about that. Well, listen. Well, with, wait, hold on. So Scott. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. Oh Perry, Perry Marshall. Oh we talked about the 80-20, right? <laughs> so there's this <laughs> idea of like, yeah, when I look at my portfolio and when most investors do, there's a few that just perform really well. And so I'm, I'm definitely like, I agree with that, that- it would be much better to own that 20% that give you most of your income and the fewest headaches than to own a whole bunch. That said, the caveat on that is that when you're just getting started, if you need to get out of your job quickly, which I did, I mean, I had a horrible job. I bought anything I could to get me the cash flow I needed to get out. And I don't regret that at all. But now that today I don't need that cash flow, I mean, what's that, you know, the properties give me a headache, what's all added up, it's like, what, two grand a month? It doesn't really make that big of a financial thing in my life. So I no longer need those. And so it kind of depends on your personality or, or not your position in life. As so well. when are you going to sell them by? I am selling half my portfolio this year. That's actually my goal. That's we'll awesome. Oh, um, we'll see. Love it. And yeah, I would say that, you know, you know, my belief is I, I have a job that I love and I'm very happy doing this. And so I am not looking to as aggressively as possible, take on as much work as possible outside of that to build passive cash flow, right? Uh, what you call passive cash flow, right? Instead, I can buy <laughs> it's one always property. quote unquote passive. It's like yeah, it's passive until you hear Brandon ripping his hair out about the latest <laughs> drama in his forty thousand dollar house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Instead, instead of you know, like, let's say you know, um, I, I can buy one property a year, stabilize it, and have a nice investment that I don't have to really worry about too much throughout the rest of the year. Save up my cash through my my career and what I'm doing when I'm you know the other cash flow for my properties, and just buy a larger property instead of more properties um, each year. And that's how I'll, I'll scale my portfolio. So. Yeah, it makes sense. It just shows that there's different, uh, what's the, like the phrase, different strokes, different folks. So, yep. all right, uh, next question. Uh, how about this one? We'll do this one. Uh, how I went, this was your newest post. How I went from, yes. or one of your newest one, how I went from $0 net worth to, qualify, to qualifying for a million dollars in real estate financing in two and a half years. 
Which, by so, the way, a guy in the hold on, the guy in the forums, Ryan Naylor, said this quote, probably one of the best articles I've ever read on BP. So yeah, that article is wow. amazing. If you have not read it, go to the show notes, biggerpockets.com slash show two twenty three and read it. Unbelievable. Okay, so explain it. Well, yeah. So I mean, this kind of this is kind of like what what my philosophy is is bringing about right here, right? Is because I focus heavily on my personal financial position and I house hack. And by doing those two things, it, it gives me access to a ton of opportunities. Um, in this particular scenario, I, I, I again use, I, you know, it's fresh in my mind. That's why I've used this example a few times in this, in this particular podcast. But, um, you know, I use the example of Joey who makes the 85K a year and buys the $400,000 house. And I contrast that to, to me. Joey's lender is going to tell him, I'm sorry, Joey. Um, I know you want to get involved in real estate investing, but you have, you know, you don't have enough income to buy a property. You don't have any savings. Come back to me when you've accumulated seventy thousand dollars. If you want to buy that four hundred thousand dollar rental property, otherwise Joey's going to have to buy his forty thousand dollar property in Podunk. That's probably more likely to annoy him <laughs> than help him build wealth. Now, when I talk to the lender um, just last week, the lender tells me, "Mr. Trench, you know, I see that you've got a uh, uh, some ca- cash flow in rentals here. Um, that's great. We can use the cash flow from these from the from these rentals." Um, to cover the mortgage payments that exist on that. So you have actually, you know, that actually increases your purchasing power. I see you've got a good job, just like Joey. That alone gives you a couple hundred thousand dollars in purchasing power. Let's tack that on. And by the way, did you know that as an experienced landlord, you can use the potential rent from a future purchase to help you qualify for financing? So, you know, I looked at those numbers and he was like, you know, if you, if you, if I were to buy a house hack, I could buy up to like eight hundred, nine hundred thousand dollars in a quadplex with five percent down, or less, and I can put down fifteen percent on like a duplex or something like that, or a single family home, and I could purchase well over a million dollars in real estate right now, and that's a result of again that experience as a landlord and that uh, accumulation of cash over several years and just good per- financial habits. Habits that we that we discuss at great length in Set for Life um, that have put me in that position to be able to basically buy as much real estate as I want. Now, again, my philosophy is to be a little bit more conservative than that and keep my options open. So I win in a down market, win in an, a stable market, and win when the market goes up. So I'm not going to actually buy all that real estate. I'm going to buy something probably in the five six hundred thousand dollar range. But the option to do so is what makes this so easy. If you approach real estate from a strong personal financial position. It can be very achievable, very manageable, and you can just focus on finding great deals and not worrying too much about your business collapsing on you. Scott, how old are you? Uh, I'm 26. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. You little, little brat. Um, <laughs> it's, it's funny. It's, it's all, at this point, it's a, a running joke around the office that like we all look up to the 26-year-old who is wiser than all of us. Um, but, uh, all right. Last, last article. Um, let's see. I've got a choice of two. Um, how about this? Am I missing something or is real estate investing really not that hard? I think that's going to potentially piss a lot of people off, right? (laughs) Yeah. So, so, you know, in that article, I I cite three people uh, as examples that, and these people are to be admired. You know, this is, I cite Brandon Turner, who's built an incredible portfolio from scratch, hard work, hustle, and sweat. Um, I cite Ben Labovich, who had a medical condition that forced him to build a real estate empire with creative financing. He was a musician before that and did not have access to a lot of money. And so he had to really hustle to, to syndicate some deals and put together some cash flow so that his family could survive when his profession, when income from his profession dried up. And then Jared Sturm, who is one of the most impressive people I've ever, I've ever, uh, I've ever even heard of. Uh, he's 26 and is, and is already a multimillionaire through real estate investing. And he's never known another way of building wealth. He started when he was 17 and built a huge portfolio. I'm not like you guys. <laughs> I'm building real estate wealth the easy way. Each one of those three guys, they had to struggle. They had to work hard. They had to put in time, sweat. They had to risk lots of, you know, put, put lots of money at risk, uh, use extreme leverage and creative financing. Um, and the difference between those three and someone like myself is I've got a great job, right? And so I can produce a similar financial result in five to seven years the easy way by saving the money from my job, working hard, living frugally, and putting that money down on solid deals that I find um, with kind of more traditional financing. And both of those strategies work. 
and have produced millions of dollars in wealth for many individuals. Um, but if you're doing it with the sound financial position while working a full-time job, real estate can be a side business and does not have to be a really challenging endeavor. There's always trouble. There's always situations you have to work through. But if you have the cash position, uh, the self-education, and you're going to operate your property reasonably and intelligently, you can, you can navigate most of those waters. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. All right, man. Well, before we wrap up the, the main part of the show, last question here. As a young real estate investor who's found success in, in a challenging market, um, can you talk directly to those of our listeners who are young and are struggling to get that first deal? Like, What, what advice would you give to that young guy who, or gal who's just you know stuck in a rut and just really struggling to get that first deal going? Uh, you know, my, my advice is it's not it's not linear growth, right? So many people think of like, oh, I'm going to build a real estate portfolio, and I want to get 100 units in 10 years. So I'm going to buy 10 this year, 10 next year, 10 the year, 10 the year after that, um, etc. Well, what really happens is people buy one property and then two the next year, and then four, and then eight, and then 16, and it's a it's an exponential snowball of growth. And it's and it's the same thing for every aspect of personal finance. You know, if you're just starting out, like like I was, uh, with three grand to your whole name, no credit history, you know, nothing. You know that you can't do anything at that point. You just have to slog it through for that first year and save your pennies and work really hard. And once you have that, you know, after that first year, I had I had built my credit. Um, I had twenty thousand dollars saved, and the option to buy a house was presented to me, right? I sat in that house for a year, worked hard, managed my property, collected my rent, saved my pennies. And, you know, next year I had the option to acquire another property. And then two years later, here I am. And all of a sudden I have access to a million dollars in financing and purchasing power, right? It's incredible. But it wasn't like I had a hundred thousand dollars the first year to, you know, you know, 200 next year, three, four, five. It's, I had nothing. Then I had 200,000 and now I have a million and it's, it's that kind of snowball of growth that you have to kind of foresee. I'm going to do each step the first way. I know I don't have to build all of my wealth through frugality. I just use that as a starting point. I know I don't have to always be working a job to earn my money. It's just the point, the way that I will accumulate money so that I can invest and buy or build assets for myself down the line. Um, and just kind of recognizing that exponential growth, I think, is the key. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, it's great. Cool. All right. Well, hey, let's shift over to a different part of the show which we lovingly refer to as... It's that. time for the fire round. All right, let's get to these fire round questions. Of course, these come direct out of the Bigger Pockets forums, which our users can get to by going to biggerpockets.com forward slash forums. Number one, with prices skyrocketing, for those of us with a day job and who want to go passive, is there even a point to investing right now? Yeah, so I think that goes right back to what I was talking about earlier with the dollar cost averaging there. Um, you know, if, if let's say Denver, for example, may be at the top of a market cycle. If you buy right now and you're not going to be able to buy for another five years, that's a bad investment, right? Because you're going to be completely dependent on the market continuing to improve or, or remaining stable in order to con you know, continue to maintain your current financial position. But if you're going to buy once every year to 18 months, uh, if you can figure out a way to do that, such as by house hacking or, you know, uh, maybe you earn a high income and can save and buy that those properties, then my argument is you, you know, I'm not smart enough to time the markets. I don't know anybody who who really is is, is, is that smart. Buy, buy today, buy tomorrow, buy next year, buy at the, the top of the market, buy at the bottom of the market, buy consistently and build a business that's that works in all three in all three scenarios. So when if you lose or when when if, when if the market goes down. When if the market is stable and when if the market goes up. Cool. Awesome. All right. When should I pay my contractors? Should a contractor receive 75% upfront or should they be paid in smaller increments? So I, I have taken on most of the work for my properties, uh, do it yourself style. Um, and I've hired a contractor only in a few instances and they've billed me after the work is completed. So I'm not a good resource for uh, significant rehab work here. Okay. Uh, I can say uh, on my properties, I, I don't give 75% down. <laughs> That's way too yeah. much money. I, what, sh what should they give? Well, I mean, like, I think it depends on who's buying the materials. If it's a brand new contractor, I like to buy materials up front and I might give them a little bit, like a thousand bucks or something like that. Like, hey, this is for your overhead, whatever. To get. And uh, even that depends on how, if I've got them from a recommendation and stuff. But I, don't, I always want to make sure I'm ahead. I always want to make sure that yeah. if they walk away, I win. Like, 
I don't want them to to win if they walk away like the guy who stole five grand from me last year. Lesson learned. Yeah. All right. There you go. Number three. Th- this was an interesting question. So I was actually scrolling through the forums looking for good questions to ask you, Scott. And I noticed there was like five questions that were all the same, but had different town names. Should I invest in insert town name here? Should I invest in insert town name here? And it was all people asking, should I invest in this town? What do you say to people who's asking that question about any town in America? Should I invest in blank? So, you know, there, there's extremes, right? You know, if you're in downtown San Francisco, you know, that may not be a good place to invest if, as, a, as a first-time person making a, a middle-income salary, right? Because you're not going to be able to produce cash flow, and you're probably not going to be able to finance a property at that price point. You know, the same goes if you're living in, you know, a, a not-so-great a, a not neighborhood in, in part of a city. You may not want to tie yourself to that part of the, of the country or that part of the city for years or decades, as real estate investing, investing does mean that you will be, you know, in part personally tied to that area. My belief, though, is that for you know, a broad majority of folks, it's really wise to at least consider your local area. Um, for example, he- here in Denver, you know, by investing locally, I'm able to manage the property myself. Uh, to give you an ex- instance, that duplex that produces $2,600 a month in rent, I might pay $260 per month for property management there. Well, that property maybe took eight hours all of last year. I don't make more than $260 an hour. Uh, you know, Josh, maybe you can help me out with that. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, if I don't make $260 an hour, like why on earth would I hire that out to somebody else, right? It's, it's, it's something I can, I can easily achieve and it's good experience for uh, as my portfolio scales. So I can save really big on that cost. I can go check out problems. Uh, I, get, I can look people in the eye. And I believe there's a really big value to that that directly helps with the in, investment returns. So if you're not at one of those extremes, um, I definitely think that investing locally is the key. And again, you know, if your market's hot or cold, are you are you committed to building wealth over the long term through real estate? If you're going to be one and done, you know, that's always that's always a big risk when it comes to investing. So, right on. All right, last question of the fire round. The the question is as long as an answer. Uh, I just graduated a little less than a year ago, and I want to start investing. But a huge hurdle I'm not sure how to overcome is how to manage my hundred thousand. K plus in student loans. Currently, I'm on a 10-year plan paying $1,100 a month, currently renting a place for also $1,100 a month. This was before I chose to start being smart with money, but will be out in less than six months. I make about $3,200 a month, but obviously have other expenses, food, gas, car, maintenance, so on and so forth. I've got about ten k saved up currently for a down payment or emergencies. I'm really open to any suggestions or ideas as to how to manage my student loans in order to begin my real estate investing career. Okay, so in, in Set for Life, I talk about debt, good debt versus bad debt and that kind of stuff. And I also have a bonus content that talks about debt reduction at length. But the fact of the matter is that, you know, for, for, for many people, debt is either a non-issue because they don't have very much or it's not significant. It's something that is all consuming. They have many bad debts and lots of credit card debt and poor credit score. Or they're like this person that has a large amount of a single type of debt that's not necessarily classified as like a bad debt that's hurting their credit score. Right. And for this person with that kind of student loan debt, the answer is unfortunately fairly simple, which is. You're going to have to, you know, first make sure that it's financed at, at, a, at the lowest rate available. Um, so definitely check that out before, you know, before you do anything else. You can look at uh, resources like SoFi um, to, to finance that. But then once you've kind of, once you've got, got that rate, it's now going to come down to hustle. You know, how can you get your lifestyle expenses as low as possible? How can you, you know, uh, build up that reserve so that you can go and take on higher paying work or, or work with more opportunities? And how can you mitigate the consequences of having taken on that debt as much as possible? And that's going to be that's going to be you know a slog and a grind, and that person's going to have to work really hard to get back to zero, and then really go towards financial freedom. On the other side of the spectrum, if that debt is really low interest, you know let's say two, three, four percent, that person could also consider you know making the payments consistently and hustling as hard as they can to build wealth in spite of those payments, which are a drain on their cash flow. Outside of that, so it's going to be up to that person. But either way. That debt is going to be a uh, a hurdle that they'll need to they'll need to work hard to push through, and it'll be a disadvantage relative to other folks. Biggest thing is try to avoid those kinds of big debts when you can. Yeah, so. there you go. 
I, I, whenever I see that kind of thing too, I always wonder, and, and I'm not down on the person at all because I know this just happens, but when you have $100,000 in student loan debt, I have to assume you would then therefore have a degree. And it's probably something you could earn more than $3,200 a month doing if you hustled and went and found a better job. And so not always, not always. I know not, not always, always, but, but, but that, that kind of goes to most people end up doing crappy jobs that they yep. hate despite their degree. And frankly, you know, it's a debate I have at home with my wife and we, we, I taught, I taught high school, she taught, and we were both college educated and firmly believe in the value of certain types of degrees. I, you know, I think the value of a college education has gone down dramatically yeah. in, in, in the modern economy. I mean, I, I think there's certain skill sets. You, Scott had talked about somebody who works for us who went to a boot camp, learned how to code through the boot camp, and, you know, uh, was able to get a, a job that, that pays very well working for, here uh, for bigger pockets. I mean, there's opportunities like that that exist that allow you to forego college. And I, I know college is cool and fun and, and all that, but you know, in the modern economy, you don't necessarily need it. Um, there's, there's more options today, I think. Yeah. And, and, another thing, and, and to piggyback on that point, history is a hobby, right? And I have, I have a, I'm, a, I'm a history and economics major because I liked history. I was but a history I chose major, too. A major. I know that. Yeah, I, cho I chose a major Nervous. that offered me economics, right? The economics part of that, that added on to that to help me do that. And I also double minored in finance and corporate strategy. So because of my holistic thing, I was able to study what I really liked and really found interesting, which is the history part, and have an employable degree. And my argument would be, hey, if you're going to go to college and take out a large amount of debt, you better get a, a marketable degree rather than something that, yeah. you know, like a history degree that's not going to pay a lot, right? Yeah. You can always study history, English, liberal arts, any of those things on your own. And I love studying those things. I read a lot of books on, on, on stuff like that because I, I love it and find it interesting. But it's not – I don't pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for that luxury. Yeah. yeah I'll I, pay I, something that will help me increase my income. I, I agree. And I went through the same thing in college. It's, you know, when I went into college, I went in with the marketable degree, which was the, the, the business major. Realized I, I just didn't get along with the kids because I thought they were you know, too cutthroat. Um, in B school at freshman year, it was just like, really? Really? Is this what the world's like? No, it doesn't have to be. So I left. It's like, what do I want to do? I want to learn about anthropology. I want to be Indiana Jones. Like I studied anthro. Then I studied psych and start learning about the human brain and how, how things work. And then I stopped and I was like, what, what am I doing? What am I doing? Like I'm going to leave college without any skills to give me a good career. And so I ended up getting a poli sci degree because I'm fascinated with poli sci and that's just the thing that I, I love. Um, but went back and ended up getting that marketing degree, uh, because I knew that would help me in the business world because I, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't going to be Indiana Jones and I wasn't going to be Sigmund Freud and Freud and, 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 uh, you know, I, I think a lot of people fail to, to do that. And, and it's, it's not hard, you know, tell your kid, look, I'm going to send you to college. You can go study anything and everything you want, but you have to also study business, engineering, you know, any of these skills that I think will allow somebody to uh, do well. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah it, just, it just gives you a mix, right? It gives you the opportunity to, to try what you love. And if you fail and if you're broke, uh, you know, starving artist, you know, now you have something to fall back upon. Yeah, cool. All right, well, let's, uh, let's wrap this thing up with our world-famous Famous, famous, famous four. four. All right, these questions are the same four. We ask the guests every single week. And Scott Trench, I know you've heard most episodes of our show, I'm sure. So number one, I'm not even going to ask it. You ask the question, Scott. What's, what's the first question? What is your favorite business book? Real estate oh, book. Come real on. Estate book. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's your favorite real estate book? <laughs> uh, my favorite, my my favorite real estate book is probably the book on you know, I, I work here, but it's also my favorite book, which is the book on rental property investing by oh. Mr. Brandon Turner here. Thank nice. you, Scott Trench. I'll pay you, you your twenty bucks later. Nice, nice. <laughs> All right, favorite business book, Scott. My favorite business book is The One Thing by Jay Papazan. So and Gary and Keller. Gary Keller. We always forget Gary. Yeah. <laughs> we shouldn't forget. Yeah. Great book. Well, Great book. And uh, that's the book that we give to. All of our new employees, it's it's fantastic. 
Um, and, and I will say also, you know, I love Rich Dad Poor Dad. I love I love those books, and those definitely were some of the first ones that I read and changed my mindset. My big kind of pet peeve with them is they they never really explain the how to portion of escaping yeah. the rat race, getting out from that kind of uh, nine to five you know nine to five job to a state of financial freedom. And so again, that's that's why I wrote Set for Life is because that is what you know what I believe is hey here's the piece of like here's the step by step guide to reducing your expenses. Here's the the philosophy around income production and investing that will that will help you actually make that transition. So I love it. Perfect. I totally agree. What do you do for fun, Scott? So what I do for fun, I play rugby. Um, I well, I used to play rugby and ski, but then I uh, got involved in a rather serious uh, foot injury through a rugby match and uh, have been on crutches for about ten weeks. Um, just got off from two weeks ago in a, in a walking boot. So once I heal up, my what I would like to do would be um, play rugby. Ski, hike, do things that are outdoors, cook, um, write blog posts for bigger pockets, that kind of nice. stuff. Awesome. Awesome. Nice. All right. My last question. Scott, what do you believe sets apart successful real estate investors from all those who give up, they fail, or they never get started? In, in addition to taking action, I think I'm going to go back to what I said earlier about that uh, mindset of exponential growth understanding that what I'm doing today is what I need to do to get to the next level, right? What I need to do today is I need to save money and hustle hard and sell more and help help build this thing. Um, and then what I need to do later will be completely different, right? It'll be, you know, I'll, you'll need to focus on divesting some of those cash flow properties um, and building something that is more scalable or more conducive to, to what you're looking to do. So Awesome. Awesome. That's great. Well, Scott, thank you. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for writing this book. I think you're going to change a lot of people's lives with with Set for Life. I I, I really do mean that. And uh, thanks for sharing your philosophy because I, I, you know, as much as um, I say it to you, I can't. I don't think I can say it enough. And I think Brandon, you and I agree on this completely. Like I think we both learn more from you than you claim to learn from us. And it's it's astounding. So so you know, thank you for for sharing and being there for for us and and. Uh, being willing to to share your philosophies with all of us. You guys taught me everything I know, so I don't know what you're talking about. But. <laughs> <laughs> all right, man. Take care, Scott. Let's see you in about right. three minutes. Sounds good. <laughs> maybe, maybe less than that. Maybe one minute. So. Oh, maybe. <laughs> all right. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. All right. Big thanks again to Scott. Wow. That thing was, that was a long show, but you know, like, I mean, we could have gone for hours and hours and hours more talking about this stuff. Cause we do, that's what you yep. and I like to do on the side is talk to each other and talk to Scott about, you know, personal finance and wealth building and money. Yeah. Not a week goes by that Scott and I don't spend at least an hour or two. They're just talking about all this stuff over and over and over. And, uh, I don't know. I, I love the way his mind works. I love the way he writes. I mean, this book seriously is fantastic. Uh, just listening to Scott's interview was amazing. I mean, I pick up stuff every time I talk to him. So yeah, I'm, I'm super pumped to, uh, you know, have had that chance to talk with him in front of 150,000 people. At least, at least, at least. This, might, yeah, this yeah. show might get millions because it's so good. Yeah, this this might be one of our bigger shows for sure. So, all right, guys. Well, listen, thank you so much for listening. We really do appreciate it. This was show 223 of the Bigger Pockets podcast. If you like the show, if, you, if, if you're if you a fan of the podcast, please get out there, jump on iTunes, jump on SoundCloud, jump on Stitcher, jump on anywhere that, that you listen to the show and do leave us a rating and review. Uh, those really do help us. They help to get more exposure for the show. Um, and of course, please do subscribe. And lastly, if you love it that much, get on social media, get on Facebook, Twitter, you name it, and share this episode. Share the link to biggerpockets.com slash show 223. Tell your friends, your family um, to, to listen up and, and learn something. Um, but uh, that's it. Until next week, I'm Josh Dorkin. Signing and off. That, and that's Brandon <laughs> Turner, and we're <laughs> signing off. <laughs> well done. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online.